Man, we're so glad that you're here. We are continuing our You Ask For It series. Last week, we talked about dealing with stress, and uh, we probably need to re-preach that here in just a moment for all you people that are stressed out, again, kind of like me. So, But today, we're going to jump into the question, how do I discover God's will? Man, one of the fascinating things about this showing up as one of the most requested topics on the survey is the fact that we are interested in knowing the will of God. Because if we want to be really candid today, a lot of people are not interested in God's will. A lot of people are, as a matter of fact, that's, that's the primary dilemma of our life is that we're interested in our will. We're interested in doing what we want to do, when we want to do it, and when we want God to get involved, we usually want him to bless our will. We just want God to get on board with our plan, our ideas, kind of our dream for our life, and just help us get where we want to go, not really oriented around, God, what do you want for my life? But this morning, the reality is no matter how young you are or no matter how old you are today, God has a plan plan and a purpose for your life. And I know living and being in church my whole life, I run into this a lot of times, man. People is, you know, th this was a topic that we talked about a ton when we're talking to young people through the years in youth ministry. But when you start talking to adults, a lot of people feel like that day that season has kind of passed them by that maybe because of the decisions that they made or maybe they grew up in church as a young person, but the moment they were given the freedom to choose whether or not to be involved, they ran as hard and as fast as they could in the other direction. And then as they got older and got married and started having kids, they kind of returned to their roots. And the idea was, you know, that that season or that idea of God having a plan for my life, I kind of missed out on that. And now I just want to be a good Christian. I want to go to church and make sure my kids are raised in the right environment. Listen today, the apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome. He said, the gifts and the callings or the plans and the desires of God are without repentance. And what that means is that God didn't change his mind. That you might have ran because of your actions, you might have delayed the plan of God, you might have missed some opportunities in that season, but what God plans you for, what God desires for you hasn't changed because God doesn't change his mind based on our actions, the plan and, and the purposes of God remain the same. So this morning... We are having significant issues. We want to we want to jump into the scripture this morning, guys. Go ahead and throw that first one up on the screen. In in James, he writes this. Now, listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. He's like, look, we we've got a plan. There are people that are going to say, man, this, this this is my desire, this is my dream, this is what I want to do. You know, this is my will. Then he says, why you don't even know what will happen tomorrow? And then he asks this question, what? is your life he's like you look you look you've got plans you've got dreams and your ideas but why are you getting so caught up in temporal things and then he asks this pointed question what is your life and then he then he defines it he says you're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes and the greek word there for mist is literally the vapor that rises off of boiling water that as quickly as we see it it dissipates into the air and he's like, look, you're so caught up in the temporal things that what you really should be concerned about are the eternal things. And listen today, it's not that God is not concerned with the with the day-to-day -day minutia of our life. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus teaches and goes into incredible detail about how aware, how involved he is in the daily minutia of our life. But ultimately, all of those things will pass away. But there are things that God has created created us for that are going to live beyond the temporal and that is we will live and do this what it is that God has created us for and then in first John chapter 2 it says the world and its desires pass away again those temporal things that we get so caught up on so focused on those things are going to pass away but the man who does the will of the Lord lives forever or what he does concerning the will of God will live ultimately beyond his immediate life. And I know today, no matter how old you are, whether you're a teenager in high school and you're thinking about the future or you're not even thinking about the future, or maybe you're just on up in years and managing life and kids and careers and work, we're all dealing with decisions 
that if we're a follower of Jesus, more than likely, we want to know what God thinks. We want to know how it is that God is leading us. There's decisions that we're facing. You know, when we were a kid, it was like, you know, am I going to play baseball or football? Am I going to be in cheer or gymnastics? And then when as we got on up older in, in high school, it was like, you know, what college am I going to go to? And, and when I go to college or if I go to college or if I'm able to go to college, you know, what am I going to major in? What, what's my career track going to be? And then it was like, who am I going to marry? Can I find somebody that will marry me? You know, is there anybody out there for me? And you get married, and it's like, you know, should we have kids now? Should we wait? Or whoops, there it is. You know, what are we going to do now? Or, you know, should we have one, three, five? Or, you know, no, you know, no, no. So, you know, just be careful there. And it's like, you know, should we buy? Should we rent? You know, should I take this promotion? It's going to move us to another city. I mean, there are significant decisions that we make through life that will impact the direction of our life that we need to know what it is. That God thinks what it is, where it is that God is leading us. This morning, there are some bad ways to to kind of try to discern the will of God. There's kind of the fleece. You know, if you've been in church, you're kind of familiar with the story of of Gideon who put a fleece before the Lord. And a fleece is just a condition of like, you know, it's like the middle of August, you know, in in Oklahoma. And we're like, God, if if it's 75 and raining today, I'm going to invite Bob to church. You know, but if it's not, I'm going to discern that that's your will that I not invite Bob to church. Or it's like the guy that was driving up to you know, a Krispy Kreme, I let there be a parking spot right in front of the door. And praise God, after the fourth time around the block, there that parking spot was. Hallelujah to the glory of God. And then for some people, there's kind of the flipping point method of like, you know, God, I get your Bible, and I got to really need to hear from you today. And they just open their Bible and, and read, and like maybe God's going to speak. And for one guy, it was like, God, I really need to hear your voice. And his Bible falls to Hosea chapter 1, and he reads this. The Lord said to Hosea, go and marry a prostitute and have children of prostitution. <laughs> He's like, well, let's try that again. So he flips his Bible again, and it turns to Luke. And it says, Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So that, that, that's probably not the best method of trying to discern the will of God. So today we're going to try to answer that question of how do I discern God's will. And then there's always the question of like how, how narrow or how broad is the will of God. Like, you know, I've heard people teach, especially to young people, like there is a person that God is destined for you to marry. And then you're like, well, what if I get that wrong? Because if I get it wrong, I not only screw myself up, but I screw that person up, and then I mess up the person I was supposed to marry because now they're stuck. They've got to marry outside the will of God. The person that I married, the person that was supposed to marry them, is now stuck outside of the will of God, and you've got these dominoes of one decision I made has just disrupted the will of God for everybody. And then there's those people that are like, you know, when it comes to death, it's like, well, it's just that person's time. Well, that's all good and well, but what if I'm on an airplane and it's the pilot's time? You know, that that has a trickle-down effect into other people. So, like, how narrow, how broad is the will of God? So, just for a couple minutes this morning, I want to go 30,000 foot on this will of God and talk about really the theology behind it and then in our clothes. Yeah, you know, when when you go to a golf course, there's this thing called the fairway, and it's where the really short grass is. And if you've never played golf, you always want to be hitting a golf ball from the really short grass. It just makes things a whole lot easier. Now, if you play like... Like I play, you kind of zigzag back and forth between woods and ponds and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, my, my goal when I play golf is to come home with more balls than what I went with. Because I know I'm going to lose some, but the, the, but the hope is that when I'm looking for my ball that I can find other people's balls. They kind of play like I do. But ultimately, you want to hit off the short grass in the fairway because oh, those are the easiest shots. So really, the will of God is kind of like a fairway. It's, it's a zone that you want to stay in that makes life easier. When you get outside the fairway, the grass is taller, or there may be trees, there may be hazards, bunkers, ponds. It's hard to hit a golf ball out of water in case you've never tried it, Um, but you want to stay within the zone because it just makes playing the game easier, and the will of God is a whole lot like that. Really, the will of God is a whole lot like a puzzle as well, and we're going to explain that. There is what we would call the sovereign will of God. 
the sovereign will of God. If you're taking notes this morning, I encourage you to follow along. A lot of content we're going to walk through. And, and, and we can define the sovereign will of God as this. This is what God is doing on the earth. This is what God, this is what God's plan for humanity is. This is what God's, we, we would call this in a theological sense, God's plan of redemption, that ultimately God desires every person to be in relationship with him, that every person that breathes earth's air will ultimately spend eternity with God, and the will of God is directed toward that, redeeming humanity. So this is what God is doing in the earth. And when you start putting together a puzzle, if you do it logically, the first thing you do is you start finding the outside pieces because once you define the frame of the puzzle, it, start, it helps to start feel, filling in the actual puzzle. And we could say that the sovereign will of God is like the outside pieces of a puzzle. God's plan for your life will never fall outside his sovereign will. That God's peace for you is always going to fit inside the frame of the puzzle. And secondly, there is the moral will of God. The moral will of God. And this can be defined as what God has already said in his word. In the same way that God's plan for your life will never fall outside the, the sovereign will of God, what God wants for your life will never fall outside the moral will of God. The moral will of God has been revealed through the Ten Commandments. You know, if you feel like God is leading you, if you're married and God is leading you into a relationship with another person, uh, no, he's not. Because God's plan will never fall outside his moral will of like, thou shalt not commit adultery. If you feel like it's God's will that you off somebody, no, that's not God's will. So God has a moral will. Even in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writes, he said very specifically, he said, it's the will of God that you abstain from sexual immorality, that you not be controlled by your emotions of lust and greed, that you live a life that is pure and honorable to God. So if you want to know what God's will for your life is, he wants you to pursue a life of purity, of honor, of holiness in his presence. So the moral will of God is what God has already said. So in the terms of a puzzle, the, the kind of the, the, the picture on, on the front of the puzzle, this is what we're aiming for, that ultimately then when God puts all the pieces together, this is what it's going to look like. So when we evaluate our lives, when we start considering our individual piece of the puzzle, we've got to ask, does it fit within the theme? Does it look like what it is that God has already said, what God is already doing in the world? Because God's plan for our life will never fall outside of what is already revealed and what his overall plan for the world is. In Psalm 139, I love this is one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. David writes, he said, your eyes saw my unformed body. And I love this line, all the days ordained planned, predetermined for me were written in your book before one of them became to be. Before you ever breathed earth's air, God had a plan and a purpose for your life. And this is the personal will of God. This is the personal will of God. And we would define this as what God desires for your life. That in light of the overall work that God is doing in the world, in light of the overall character that God has already revealed of what he wants mankind to look like, of how he wants us to reflect his character, God has a plan and a purpose for your life. So let me give you a statement this morning that will really help define the context of where we're going from here. The more I get to know the sovereign will of God and the moral will of God, the easier it will be for me to discern the personal will of God. The more I get to know the sovereign will of God and the moral Ill, will of God helps clarify, will help me discern the personal will of God for my life. So before we give you the six questions, let's do a little pretest in light of the sovereign will of God and the moral will of God. The first question to ask is, what am I doing that I should not be doing? When you begin to evaluate the moral will of God, what am I doing that God has already said, hey, don't do that? When you think about it, the law of God is kind of like
railing and you need the little rails on the side. Anybody willing to admit that? I'm horrible. You know, just throw the ball and hope it stays in the lane kind of thing. You know, the, the, the moral will of God is really like the lanes in the bowling alley. Kind of helps us from falling, it helps, keeps us from falling off into the gutter of life and not scoring, not winning, not fulfilling God's desire for our life. So the first thing to ask today is what am I doing that's outside of the moral will of God? Because today, if I'm living outside of what God has already revealed, God's personal, individual, unique plan for my life really doesn't amount to anything if I'm not already living a life of obedience to God and what he has already revealed to us. A little bit further down in Psalm 139, where we read that beautiful verse about God planning a life for us, listen to the prayer that the psalmist prays. Verse 23 says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is anything offensive in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God, search my heart. And this morning, that's a prayer I believe we ought to pray every day in some form. God, search me. Know me. God, what's going on in my life? My attitudes, my actions, my habits, my behaviors. God, is there anything in you, anything in me that's offensive to you that falls outside of what you've already revealed? And God, if there is, lead me back onto the plan and the path that I need to be. The second question is this, what am I not doing that I should be doing? What am I not doing that I should be doing if God has already revealed his sovereign will of what his plan and purposes for the world are and if his will for my life will always fall inside the framework of what God is doing in the world, what am I not doing that I should be doing? You know, the word of God is clear that as followers of Christ, that we should be serving others, that we should love people, that we should forgive one another, that we should live generous lives, not consuming everything we bring in for ourselves, our own pleasures, own pleasures and desires, but we should live open-handed to the world, lives of generosity. So what should I be doing that I'm not doing? What is God doing in my world that I'm not really getting on board with, that I'm not getting involved in? And this morning, if you're kind of here and you're like, man, I'm not really doing a whole lot. You know, this is what God's doing in the world. And I'm just, you know, I'm just, I'm here. You know, I'm sitting on a chair on a Sunday morning, but I'm not really doing much more than that. Man, we want to invite you to attend our growth track. Meets every Sunday during the second service. You can show up on a Sunday and just go straight to it. You don't even have to attend church. Uh, your kid, if you got ch- kids, you can check them into our uh, children's environments and just go straight to the growth track. We want to help you discover how God designed you. We want to help you identify what your peace looks like and how your peace can fit into what God is already doing in the world so that you can get on board with the plan and the purposes that God has for you. So if you're kind of here and maybe you're new or you've been attending for a while and you're just hanging out, man, we encourage you to attend the growth track. Next month, you can skip church. And just go to the go track because we believe in it that much. We want to equip you. We want to inspire you. We want to empower you to find your design so that you can fit into the plan and the purposes of God. So this morning, I want to give you six questions that you can ask that will help you drill down into what God's personal will for your life is. Now, I just want to give a disclaimer. The first three, we're going to move through pretty quickly because they tie back to the sovereign and the moral will of God. And and, and if we kind of, if you stumble on the first three, you really don't need to go any farther. You need to deal with business there. The first question is this, is this my will or God's will? This is a battle that we fight every day. This is a battle that we fight moment by moment every day. This really underscores the reason that we need salvation because the Bible teaches that our broken nature, you see, we we don't need Jesus because we're bad. We need a savior because we want to be our own savior. 
We want to be our own God. We want to call the shots. We want to be in control. We want to chart our own path. But the Bible is very clear that when we live self-centered lives, that it always winds up being destructive, being painful. We hurt ourselves. We hurt others. And at the end of the day, God's salvation is not so much salvation from hell as it is salvation from ourselves. Because our primary dilemma is we have a will and we want to follow our will because we care about one thing. We care about us. We care about our happiness, our pleasure, our comforts, our conveniences. So when it comes to making decisions, really the first filter that we need to run it through, is this what I want or is this what God, God wants? Because at the end of the day, we're amazing at justifying and rationalizing and twisting things to find some kind of concocted reason that we should do what we want to do. Most of the times, if you're good enough, you can even find a Bible verse. This is what I believe God wants me to do. And you're like, no, you're an idiot. You're totally taking that out of context. You know, we find in uh, Matthew chapter 26, kind of in Jesus' final moments, He's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prays this beautiful prayer. He says, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, referencing the cup of suffering that he was about to drink from at the cross. You see, we believe that Jesus was fully man and fully God. And this verse really highlights the humanity of Jesus, of knowing full well what it was that he came to earth to do, to offer his life as a sin's ransom for you and I. But in his humanity, knowing the pain and the suffering that was ahead, he said, God, if there's any other way, let's go that route. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And if we're going to experience the life that God has for us, there are going to be moments, multiple moments throughout our life that we have to surrender our will our desires, our comfort, our conveniences, sometimes even in an act of sacrifice to ultimately experience what it is that God wants for us. So if you're taking notes there, write this in. I want what God wants, period. That needs to be the attitude of our life. I want what God wants, period. The second question is this. Am I in right relationship with God? Am I right with God? Listen today, if you're living outside of right relationship with God, God's plan for your life doesn't mean squat. If you're over, if you're off in the trees or if you're in the pond or a bunker somewhere, the only thing you need to get concerned with is getting back into the fairway. If you've got a puzzle piece and you're trying to fit it into another puzzle somewhere of what you want to do and who you want to be, you need to get back within the plan that God has for you of living in right relationship with you. Today, what God ultimately desires is that you walk in fellowship and intimacy, and relationship with him. And outside of that, his plan and his purposes mean nothing. Romans 12 and 2 says, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Don't commit to living just how you want to live, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And this morning, if you have any questions about God's plan, that verse answers it. God's plan for you is good, pleasing, and perfect. And if you're living outside of a relationship with him, you will never be able to experience what God ultimately has for you. Thirdly, what does the Bible say? What has God already spoken to the situation? I have, I have literally heard a person say, I really feel like God is leading me to divorce my spouse and go marry somebody else. And that's when you just want to like, in the name of Jesus, just like punch somebody in the face. I'm like, you're an idiot. Or you're a fool. Let's use biblical language. Listen, God's never going to lead you to do something that contradicts the word of God. Listen, I, grew up, I grew up in a Pentecostal environment and I heard people so abuse the spirit that they told them the Holy Spirit told them to do things that did not line up with scripture. And there were people that believed them because they're spiritual. No, they're nutcases. They're fruitcakes. God will never lead you to do something that does not align with his word. But listen today, a lot of the decisions that we make fall into the gray areas of life where the Bible doesn't clearly say thou shalt 
or thou shalt not. So let me give you three questions as we close today to kind of help filter through those decisions that we have to make. Number four, what is the wise thing to do? What is the wise thing to do? There have been, quite, there have been times in my life that I've answered the question, that asked it this way, if, if I were on the other side of the table of me and I was telling me my dilemma, my situation, my opportunity, what would I say to myself? Because there's sometimes I get excited about something and I'm like, man, I'm going to do that. That's awesome. And then I start thinking through it from another perspective and I'm like, you're an idiot. You do not need to do that. So what is the wise thing to do? Uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 5, it says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Sometimes the Bible doesn't clearly speak to an issue. But we need to consider what is the wise thing to do. And let me give you a question to kind of help drill down even further on this. In light of my past experiences, my current circumstances, and my future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing to do? You know, there are some of us that in light of where we've come from, there are some things that other people can do that we likely should not. You know, if you've had a problem with addictions in the past, it's not putting myself into that kind of environment where my vulnerability can be exposed. You know, if you've had past experiences, you know, with, you know maybe, maybe even with gambling or something, and somebody comes up to you with a hot stock tip, and you're like, man, this is a surefire winner. You need to run. You know, I, I, I've had some bad investing experiences in the past, and for some reason, I get emails all the time from these stock companies. I'm like, this is a screaming buy, and I'm like, delete delete. I, no, no, no. We're not going to believe that. We're not going to invest money there. But in light of where we've been, sometimes we've got to evaluate what's the wise thing to do. And then in light of our current circumstances, man, sometimes we allow the pressures and the anxieties and the fears of life to cause us to make rash decisions, to make bad decisions. And, and sometimes we just need to evaluate in light of where I am right now. What is the wise thing? How should I approach this situation? And then in light of my future hopes and dreams, where do I hope to be? Where do I, what do I aspire to be? What do I want to be as a person, as a husband, as a wife, as a parent? Where do I want to be in my career? Where do I want to be in my faith journey? And is this decision going to lead me closer? What is the wise thing to do? Number five. What do the people that know me and love me think? We need to seek wise counsel. It's amazing how often we've all experienced this personally. We've all seen other people that have done this. Somebody gets an idea, a desire, an opportunity, and all the people that know them and love them the most are saying, no, no but they can rationalize it and justify it in such a way that you're like, why is all my family against me? Why is everybody trying to keep me from my dreams? It's because they see it from a different perspective. They see that you're about to walk off a cliff and fall to your ruin, and they're like, stop! And you're like, no, I'm about to climb the stairway to heaven, baby. God's leading me by faith. And then they're like, no! And we've, most of us have made a dumb decision that everybody else was waving the red flag of stop. And we're like, no, there's no stopping me now until you ran into a wall and you're like, that was dumb. And then we go, why did y'all let me do that? And everybody's like, you're an idiot. Get out of here. But man, we need to seek God to counsel. Listen to what the writer of Proverbs says. He says, the way of fools seems right to them. I mean, I've played the part of a fool too many times. Man, this is the right thing. This is good. This is going to work out well. And everybody around me is going, man, you're stupid. But the wise listen to advice. Look, you don't even need to necessarily do what they say, but you at least need to stop and ask and listen to what the people that love you the most and know you the best are saying. Proverbs 11 and 14, where there is no guidance, people fall. People fall, man. People stumble. People mess up. People get off the path. But in the abundance of counselors, 
there is victory. And I think that's where we all want to live. We want to be successful. We want to walk in the victory that God has given us in this life. And the writer says that that comes when we seek godly counsel. The reality today is we all have blind spots. There are all areas of our life that we are painfully unaware of. And the value of seeking counsel is other people can see what we cannot see. I remember one time I was watching golf and somebody made a comment about Tiger Woods' golf coach. And at that time, he was like the best golfer in the world. And I was like, man, why does he need a coach? And the reality, the reason all of us need coaches, the reason all of us need people to give us input and advice is because they're, they're outside and they see us, they see our lives, they see our tendencies, our habits from a different perspective. And they're able to see what we are ultimately cannot see and their val their input should be valuable to us so we've got to seek godly counsel sixthly and lastly do i sense god's peace now listen today there's a little bit of a disclaimer on this one because again going back to our ability to justify and rationalize our behavior Sometimes we can so convince ourselves that this is the right thing that we have a false sense of peace about it. So this one has to be taken in a whole. If God's word has already spoken against it and other people around you are saying, don't do it, and you're like, but I feel such a peace, you're an idiot. So stop. So this has to be taken in totality. But Every time we have a prayer card or somebody, you know, it's like, hey, pray for us. We're going to make a decision. We're facing this circumstance. I have a tendency to pray this way. God, lead them in peace. I want God to heal. I want God to provide. I want God to deliver. But ultimately, God, lead them in peace to know that they're on the right track, that they're pursuing the right course of action, because I believe that God will lead us in his peace. So many times throughout the Bible, God speaks to us and says, fear not, fear not, don't be afraid. Why? Because God wants us to walk in the peace that comes from him. And when we are walking in the will of God, even when it is sometimes difficult, sometimes when it is uncomfortable, God will still give us a sense of peace. And I believe that peace can be our guide. First Corinthians 14 says, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. And ultimately God will lead us even through difficulty, even through sacrifice and scale of what God is doing in the world, it will always reflect the moral will of God. What character should I possess? But there is a design. There is a place for your life. And if you want to find ultimate fulfillment in Christ, you owe it to yourself to pursue relentlessly God's personal will, God's personal plan for your life. Let me pray over you this morning. Father, we love you today. God, I wanna pray first and foremost for those this morning, God, that may feel like that they've, they've just screwed up too much. God, they've ran too far, too fast. They've done too much. And God, they've just kind of resigned themselves to just being a good Christian, doing the thing. God, I pray that you would by the power of your spirit, God, destroy the lie of the enemy that says that that's all there is. That your gifts, your callings, your plans, your designs are without repentance. God, you have not changed your mind, irregardless of how they have lived. And Father, I pray that you would open up, God, their heart in a sense of spiritual curiosity that says, God, what is it? that you want for my life. God, what is it that you have planned? And I pray today from the youngest to the oldest today, God, that you would stir us. God, with a sense of holy curiosity of what is my, what is my design? What is my fit? What is my place? What is it that God has planned and designed for my life? Because I wanna discover that and I wanna live that out. God, for those that are facing decisions, God, that you would lead them. God, and help them discern. God, what it is that you're doing in their, in their life. God, how it is that you are leading them. God, what you're leading them to do, what you're leading them to stop today. God, so that we can discover the peace 
the joy and the fulfillment that comes from living within your design, from living out the personal will of God for our lives. With every head bowed, every eye closed for just a moment today. Maybe you're in the room today and you're like, man, that's, that, that's fascinating to me. That the God that created the world would have a plan for my life. But the reality today is that you're living outside of relationship with him. Maybe it's because you, you had a kind of a misconstrued idea of who God was and he was harsh and demanding, that he was a God that wanted something from you and you didn't understand that he was really a God that had something for you. Today, there's something inside of you that's saying, man, I, I wanna know this God and I wanna discover this life that he's made available to me. The Bible teaches us that relationship with God comes through one way and that's by putting our faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us on the cross and through his resurrection from the dead. That it was sin that separates us from God, but it was at the cross that Jesus paid the penalty for our sin, bridged the gap between us and God so that we could enter into relationship with him and ultimately discover this life that he's created us for. And if you're in the room today and there's just something inside of you that's stirring, that's God. That's God at work. That's God inviting you into a relationship with him because he has way more for you than he ever wants from you. And if you're in the room today and that's you and you're like, yeah, I want to accept that invitation. I want to begin a relationship with God today. Would you just acknowledge that by an uplifted hand? No one's looking around. No one's going to see. This is just kind of a moment between you and God. This morning, I want to enter into a relationship with this God. I want to discover this plan, this purpose that God has for my life. Would you stand with us this morning?